Haley Alcott, ladies and gentlemen. That's how she drives. Hope you didn't step on that diaper on the way in. That was the church parking lot. <clears throat> All right, Haley took you for a ride in her car. I want to take you for a little tour of, of my house. When you walk in our house and you look to the left, you see uh, this dining room table. That's the fancy eating table where we never eat. Don't ever eat there, right? We've owned that table for 15 years, and we've eaten probably 15 meals uh, on it uh, because we have a dining room. You have to have a dining room table, but we don't really share meals around that table. And the reason we don't is because we eat around this table. When you walk in our door and you look straight ahead, you'll see our, our kitchen table uh, there. And uh, some of you have seen this on stage. We had it refinished since then, but I brought it out here several years ago as an illustration and uh, that table is where we do all of our eating, and, and that table is not nearly as nice as our dining room table, but what it lacks in appearance, it makes up for in significance. That, that table, uh, my mom and dad bought that in the 1960s, so it is way older than me, okay? And uh, it has seen a lot of meals, and it has seen a lot of miles over the years. Fried chicken, scalloped potatoes, corn on the cob, fried pork chops, mac and cheese, soup beans, cornbread, everything growing up for me was fried, all right? It's fried, fried something and sweet tea. That's, that's what I grew up on. That table is from Kentucky. That's how we do it down in uh, the south. And then there were desserts. My mom would make homemade um, blackberry dumplings picked from blackberries that she made from scratch, topped with ice cream, peach cobbler. My dad would make butterscotch pies. So who wants to go to lunch? <laughs> all right, you hungry now? I grew up in a time and place, and maybe, maybe you did as well, where Families ate together, and it was annoying. Okay, as a kid, it was annoying because dinner always came in the middle of a dodgeball game at the Johnsons, or in the middle of a wiffle ball game at the Cons, or a basketball game at the Patrick's house. And when dinner was ready, my mom and dad they would open the door, and we had a small neighbor lived in a small neighborhood. They would just yell my name. That was like the dinner bell. Tell me dinner was ready. That didn't mean finish the game. It meant you get home right now. You get washed up and you get ready to eat dinner. I didn't have the option of warming it up later, and we ate as a family, and I did not understand why that was such a big deal when I was a kid, but with age comes a little wisdom. And now I know that it really wasn't about eating together, it was more about being together. And I didn't appreciate it then, but what my parents were doing, what seemed like an interruption was actually an investment. What I thought was an interruption was actually an investment on their part that they were making in uh, to me, and this table was the center p point of our home, the centerpiece of our home. It didn't just set the table for eating, it set the table for conversation, for talking together, sharing together, laughing together, uh, playing together. If, if this table could talk, and it could tell you some stories. And if you fast forward to today, 2018, in most homes, the kitchen table is a lot more like my dining room table. It does not see a lot of meals, it has very few conversations, and there are very few stories told around it. We would love for that to be the case, but we are just too busy. There just isn't enough time. And most of us are running at high speed all week long. And it is easy for me, and it's probably true of you, it's easy for me to go through an entire day without having a meaningful conversation with my family, because life just kind of pulls us in all different directions. And if you go ask anyone how they're doing, you know, the standard answer is 95% of the time, I'm tired. The other 5% of the time is I'm, you know, I'm busy. And busy and tired, those are kind of 
synonymous. They are one and the same. We are tired because we are busy. Now, you've heard this phrase uh, before. The days are long, but the years are short. The days are long, but the years are short. If your kids are between like the age of walking and 10, you understand long days. All right, diapers and tantrums and constant cleanups and lack of sleep and potty training and baths and blowouts, right? And then baths because of blowouts and changing clothes and piles of laundry and wiping heinies. And, you know, that's just what you, you do. Picking up Legos and finding the Legos you miss with your bare feet. Right? Anybody have that happen in their house? After Campbell was, uh, was potty trained, um, this, this is a little personal, but if, if he had to go number one, he's not here so I can tell you the story. He, if, if he had to go number one, we were out. It was a challenge, right? Because he couldn't, he wasn't tall enough to reach. And I, I would not let him go into the men's room and, and sit. Because if he fell in, I would just throw up. And that's just, okay. <laughs> And, and there's, you know, there's stuff on the seat because that's just how men do it, you know. And I just wouldn't, wasn't gonna, I wasn't going to take him home after that would happen, right? We'd have to find something else to do with him. And <laughs> so here's a parenting hack for you. I would, I would pick him up and hold him horizontally over the toilet like this. <laughs> and he's straight down in the toilet. So seriously, this is how I would do it. And this is a great workout, by the way. It engages the quads, the <laughs> biceps, the core and like, especially when he was 13, you had to stretch it out a little bit and kind of like this. So. Oh, man. But that's, that's how I did it. You can thank me uh, later. Uh, that's a parenting hack for you. Uh, if he had to go do the other business, like Janelle had to take him. Like I just, you're, he's not going in the men's room. We're just not having it. Okay. But when your kids are young, it seems like the work is never done. There is always something to do. There is always something to, to clean up. There is always something to change. The days are long, and most days you're thinking, will this day ever end? But after age 10, at least this is the way it was in our house, something happens. Like the kids are more independent, and you feel like you can finally slow down a little bit. You can actually sit down for a few minutes. You can breathe. And then you get up, and they're teenagers. And they're driving. And they're graduating. And now you're saying, where did the time go? Where did the time go? The days were long and now the years are short. And, and as the dad now of two teenage boys, in three years we will have a graduate. In six years we will be empty nesters. I am not old enough for that. My kids aren't old enough for that. I, I remember the long days, but I am now living the short years. It's transition. And here's, here's what I've noticed. When, when the days are long, there's no time for what matters most. You, you feel that, right? But when the years are short, what matters most is time. When the days are long, it seems like there's no time for what matters most. But when we get to this point where the years are short, we realize that what matters most is time, and if time is what matters most, then we have to invest our time in what matters most. Time is the one thing that you will never get back. When it's gone, it's gone. And wherever you are right now on the parenting spectrum, maybe you are a brand new parent or maybe you are a grandparent of your seventh grandchild. I just want to say, say this to you. Nobody outgrows the kitchen table. Everybody needs a place to sit and talk and connect with one another. The kitchen table like spans the generations and this is kind of the idea that Moses is giving to the Israelites as he gathers them together for his farewell speech. This is before he's passing the reins over to Joshua because God wasn't going to let him enter the promised land because of his disobedience. So Moses is getting ready to die. He's getting ready to pass away. And Joshua's going to take over. And God gives him the gift of having a conversation and giving a challenge to the Israelites, these folks that he's led for so many years. And this is what he said in Deuteronomy chapter 6. He says, These are the commandments, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them, so legacy, generations, 
may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. So Moses is given a framework. Like We're not giving you these commands to suck the life out of you. We're giving these commands as a framework that will allow you to really live richly, enjoy life. And this is what he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. And when you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Don't miss it. So what Moses is saying, don't miss it. When Carter was five or six years old, his favorite toy was an old flip phone. And he would walk around the house talking on this phone to some imaginary person. It could have been a 911 dispatcher. I don't know. But he also had a toy laptop, so he was like this young business professional, you know. And one day he set up an office in the bathroom, he had a bucket for a seat, and he put the computer on the, on the footstool, and he came out and told me that he was in a meeting. So, you know, I guess I'd have to call and make an appointment if I want to talk to him. But that's how he did it. You know why he did that? Because that's what he saw me doing. I had impressed on him unintentionally um, these kinds of things. Like he would see me talking on the phone. He would see me working on the computer. He would hear me say, I'm leaving to go to a meeting. And kids are impressionable. They are watching us. And then they imitate us. Moses knew that. And that's why he says these commands have to be on your heart. Like the only way you can impress them on your children is for them to be on your heart First, so moms and dads, what's on your heart has a good chance of being on the heart of your kids. So if that's true, before the years get short, be intentional while the days are long. You can use long days to your advantage. We said last week, every family leaves a legacy. It's either a legacy of dysfunction or it's a legacy of redemption. And a lack of intention, a lack of intentionality can lead to a legacy of dysfunction. But a little intention, a little intentionality can go a long way to leaving a legacy of redemption. Most legacies are left unintentionally by parents who wish they could have time back. Who wish they could have a do-over. And so if we are, are intentional with what we are sowing into our kids, think about what we could impress on them. All right, our kids see us talking on the phone. Do they ever hear us talking to the Lord in prayer? They see us browsing the web. Do they ever see us browsing through the word, just soaking up God's word? They, they see us rushing through the day to get everything done. Do they ever see us slow down to enjoy the day that God's given us? See, what's in us will be in our Kids, and we have to think with the end in mind. Now, the family changed dramatically in the mid uh, 19th century when the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. And it not only revolutionized the way we work, it revolutionized the home, it revolutionized the family. Before the Industrial Revolution, dads worked at home. All right, they farmed the land, they made their living farming. Agriculture was, was king. But when the Industrial Revolution came along, it pulled dads out of the home to go and work in factories. Prior to that, kids grew up watching mom and dad work hard, and then when of age, they would work hard with mom and dad. But in the middle to late 1800s, men left home in mass numbers to go work in factories, and for the first time, the family was divided. Dads were typically out of the house before the kids got up, and they came home late. After a full day of working in the factory, they were exhausted, had nothing left to give to their family. And so moms all of a sudden began doing most of the, per, the parenting in the home. So and now, as a result of all of that, now we all kind of have these, these three lives that we live. We have a work life, we have a home life, and you know, if we have any time left, we'll have a, a social life. And here's the irony in all of this. That this is where we spend most of our time at work. But this is, this is the, the one part of our lives where we can totally be replaced, right? 
Nobody is expendable in what they do. You think about your job right now. There was somebody who did it before you. There will be somebody who did it, who does it after you. All right, this church has been here for 30 years. There were pastors before me. There will be pastors after. We are all expendable here. None of us are expendable here. Nobody can take your place as dad. Nobody can take your place as mom. But yet we invest most of our time in the place where we are most expendable. Like you can make a significant contribution in your work that will one day be forgotten. But you can leave a legacy in your family that will long be remembered. And so life has been divided into these three departments. But God didn't create three lives. He created one life, and that is a spiritual life. All of life is spiritual. In which we live, we work, and we connect in the context of community. All of life is spiritual. That's what Moses says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. Because it is all spiritual. There are no compartments. And when we try to live more than one life, this is why we're so exhausted and why we're so busy. We get out of balance. And that's where a lot of us find ourselves, out of balance and spiritually exhausted, spiritually empty. We did some market research a few months ago to find out what young fathers in our community uh, valued. You know, as we think about how do we continue to reach out into our community, um, what, what are these young fathers today, what do, they, what do they value? And here are some of the things that came back. They value time and family. They value experiences for their kids. Uh, they value meaningful work. And they want work-home-life balance. That's what they're looking for. right? And we all have this question, how do we balance work and home? And Moses is speaking a truth here in Deuteronomy 6 that transcends generations and transcends cultures. What's in us will be in our kids. And so if we are always busy, always hectic, always stressed out about life, they will model those behaviors. They will pick up on those Rhythms and patterns. The number of kids today, you know this, the number of kids that deal with anxiety is insane. That was not the case 30 years ago. What's changed? Our pace of life has changed. My dad was at home at 3 o'clock every day. My mom was home at 4 o'clock every day because she worked a little further uh, away from home than my dad did. And uh, I played whatever sport was in season. There was no such thing as a sport that lasted year-round. Parents weren't running their kids all over the place, and from one field to the next, they could enjoy watching a baseball game uh, without worrying about being late for soccer practice. That's not our culture today. That's not the culture we live in today, and I think that our kids are paying for that. And an unbalanced family leads to unintended consequences. And building legacy in our family isn't about spending less time at work and more time at home. Don't misunderstand me there. Like if you go in tomorrow and tell your boss that you want to cut your hours to spend more time at home, he or she is probably going to cut you, all right, and go spend all your time at home. That's a whole different problem. That's not what I'm talking about. Here's what I'm talking about. Building legacy is not about being home all the time. It's about leveraging all the time we have. While we're at home, we can redeem the short years by taking advantage of the long days. And Moses shows us exactly how to do it. He lists four key opportunities that where we can make the most of our time without adding any time. See, here's the thing. We're not going to get more time. That's impossible. We all have 24 hours, the same 24 hours. That's it. That's all the time that we have. But here's the good news. We do these four things all the time within that time frame of 24 hours. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, because all life is spiritual. And then he says, talk about these things. Talk about God when you sit at home. When you sit at home. The Hebrew day, just like our day, divided into two sections. There's day and there's night. The key difference is we do stuff at night that wasn't possible or feasible for them to do at night. Thanks to Thomas Edison and the invention of the light bulb, 
in 1879. See, we can now work around the clock. We have first shift and second shift and third shift. It never shuts down. See, technology has been impacting us for well over a century. And with every technological breakthrough, with every technological advancement, think about this, we lose something. I mean, you just think about the smartphone and the screen time. It has brought, it has brought all kinds of cool things to us, but we've given up some things as a result. We've lost some things as a result. God created a rhythm of life that we have long since abandoned. He created a natural time for work and a natural time for rest. Israelites would work from dusk uh, till dawn, so from like, uh, or dawn till dusk. It was like 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., and once the sun stopped shining, they stopped working, and they would spend the evening with their family. And central to uh, the family time together was a meal. All right, the meal was symbolic of intimacy and inclusion. And so they would share this meal together, and the Hebrew day started at 6 p.m. So the very first part of their day was given to the most important things in their life which was relationship. They didn't have the conveniences that we have today, of the, the, of the time sucks that we have, of Facebook and email and Fortnite. Anybody playing Fortnite? Good grief, some proud kids over here. <clears throat> Families didn't have their own copy of the Torah. All right, five books of the Bible, the first five books of the Bible. And so what they did instead was they learned it through oral transmission. And so they had it, most of them had it memorized. They memorized the Torah because that's all they had to work with. How many of you know right off the top of your head you can just rattle off ten phone numbers? Hardly anybody, right? There was a day... When that's all we had to work with was memory, right? I had, when I was growing up, I had all my friends' phone numbers memorized, and today I know two. I know mine, which I don't ever call myself, and I know my wife's, Janelle's. I don't even know my kids' numbers, which is terrible, and I'm preaching this series, okay? So I need to, I need to get that fixed this afternoon. Like if I had an emergency, I would, I would have no idea what their phone numbers are. Um, see, now we just press a name, and it calls, but, but before we had, to, we had to go through this really laborious rhythm of pressing numbers. <laughs> and and that's, that, that was only convenient, you know, when I was like 13 or 14. Before that, it was the rotary, right? How many of you remember rotary? You ever get rotary finger? <laughs> I used to build calluses right here, and our prefix was 498, so it was like... I can stretch out. I mean, it just took forever to call anybody. By the time I called you, I forgot what I was going to ask you. (laughs) There was no butt dialing. (laughs) Friday, I butt dialed like 10 people because I'm laying sod. Remember, I tore up my grass. So I'm out there busy laying sod, and I got all these people calling me back. My mother in law, Keith Edwards, are like, hey, you okay? Got a call from you. It was like four minutes long. Nope, just butt dialed. Sorry about that. So, you know, if I called you, my apologies. Mark Trinkle called me last week. He's doing business down where I grew up, Mount Sterling, Kentucky, with traditional banks. He's like, you know anything about traditional bank? I said, yes. They sponsored the weather hotline when I was a kid. I would call that number every day to get the weather, 498-4711. Right? I was getting the weather on the phone long before any of you were. I remember that number. Why? Because I dialed it every single day. When you rely on memory to do something that's routine, you don't forget. This is how ancient Jews were able to memorize so much scripture. It's what they did. It was their routine. And so what they would do when they would sit sit at home together is they would tell Bible stories. And this is how their kids grew up to know the God of Israel. They heard the story. Hundreds of times of Moses crossing the Red Sea. They had heard the story of David slaying Goliath. They had heard the story of how God came to Elijah in a gentle whisper. They knew the God of Israel. And they knew their history. Because they told it over and over and over as they sat at home. That's what they did. Your job may take you out of the home. But when you're home, be home. Like, 
unplug, disconnect, sit around the table, talk to each other, have conversation, play a board game, work a puzzle, have a prayer time, do a devotional. Be intentional. And be intentional about talking about spiritual things. Leverage the time by doing something that's interesting to your kids, even if it doesn't interest you. Carter is my 13-year-old, and uh, he is just all about engines right now and learning about engines and mini bikes. And like so he's been saving his money to buy a mini bike kit, you know, where it all comes separately, the frame, the engine, all that, and you you put it all together. And so this is all he talks about. And every time he comes to me and says, Dad, I know what's coming. And I told you now last week, I'm like, if I hear it one more time, I'm just going to, mini bike. And then God convicted me. Like the reason he comes and talks to me about it is because he's inviting me into something he enjoys. And I need to accept the invitation. Because if I'm not interested in what he's talking about, why would he ever be interested in what I'm talking about? I need to step into his lane, step onto his turf. And so last week I told him, I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go half. I'm going to buy half the mini bike. And this summer we're going to work on putting it together. And we're going to have have that time together. It's probably not going to (laughs) run. But that will just be part of the story, right? Remember that time we built that mini bike and you had the engine upside down and like the gas wouldn't stay in because it was. That would happen to me, I'm pretty sure. Because I know nothing about engines. A couple weeks ago, Campbell wanted me to hit him fly balls because you know, that's his thing. You know, he's baseball, any kind of ball is good with him. And so, you know, he, he finished freshman baseball. He's got like two weeks off before summer baseball, but he can't stand it. Like, I got to be out playing ball. So he asked me to hit him fly balls. So I go out and I'm hitting him fly balls. And Ted Julian's a member of our church, lives in our neighborhood. He comes walking up the walking trail and, uh, and stops and talks to me. And I said, yeah, I, you know, I can't hit him as deep as he would want me to. And, uh, and Ted said, you know what? All that matters is that you're out here. I needed to hear that. All that matters is that I'm out there. It doesn't matter. Fly balls are irrelevant what matters is I'm out there building relational capital. What, what matters is I'm working with my son on a mini bike building legacy. None of that costs me any more time. I'm just leveraging the time that's already there. But if I fail to leverage the time that's already there, you know what it could cost me? Legacy. Legacy is always on the line. Leverage the time that you have when you're sitting at home. And then Moses says, and when you walk along the road. Now, we don't do a lot of walking along the road, but we drive a lot. We drive along the road. The car is like second home to most of us. We spend so much time in our car driving from one place to another, and it is a primary opportunity for spiritual conversation. You know why? Because they can't go anywhere. So put down the phone. Tell them to put down the phone. Like make the, make the car a no phone zone. And, and talk together. Have a conversation together. That's a personal rule that I have. I don't talk on the phone when I'm in the car with my kids. Now there have been exceptions to that. It's not law. But, but I try not to have a conversation on the phone. Because I want to be available and attentive to my kids if they want to have a conversation with me. I don't want them to have to compete with a phone. The car is not necessarily a place for like formal discussion where you're talking about behavior and that kind of thing, but it is a place for informal dialogue where we as parents can help our kids interpret life regardless of how old they are. My dad did this with me. I'll never forget this conversation because it changed the course of my life. We're driving down the interstate from Mount Sterling to Lexington, I-64. I don't have any idea where we were going or what we we're doing that day, but it was after I graduated high school and after I went to church camp. Most of you know my story. I, I didn't grow up in church, and I went to church camp. My life was turned upside down. I found Jesus, felt called to ministry, but I had already planned to attend Eastern Kentucky University. I'd already had all my finan- financial aid there. I was going that next week to register for my classes. I had a roommate. I had all the stuff, you know, and it was just a, like a month away from 
from school starting. And I told my dad, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and go for the fall because it's already in place, and I'll transfer to Cincinnati Christian University in, in the winter, in the spring. And my dad said this to me. I'll never forget this conversation. He said, Sean, if you don't go now, you'll never go. Like he knew something that I didn't know. He had seen the change in me, and he knew that going to college with the same friends would be short-lived. And that if I went to EKU, that would be it. And he was right, and so instead of registering for the classes the next week, I, I, uh, I was at my high school meeting with my guidance counselor to transfer my financial aid to Cincinnati Christian University. Um, that was a legacy conversation with a guy who wasn't even following Jesus. And my, my dad didn't become a Christ follower until 11 years after that conversation happened. And if he hadn't leveraged that time with me to help me interpret my circumstances, it may never have happened. And I'm pretty certain I wouldn't be here talking to you today. So you may think you're just driving to basketball practice. But God may be setting the stage for a conversation that will have generational ripples. All you have to do is be present and leverage the time that's already there. And he says, when you lie down, how many of you go to sleep every night? It's like the first service. None of you sleep. Like just nobody sleeps. We go to sleep every night, and a lot of parents miss this opportunity, um, especially parents of older kids, because we don't, you know, we don't put our kids to bed anymore. We send our kids to bed. And, uh, he, but your child's room, listen, I want you to understand this. Your child's room is, is their domain. It is your house, but, but that is kind of their space where like, lots of things churn and happen in the head. You know? and, and when you walk into their space, you walk into their room, it's symbolic of stepping into their life. And that's a responsibility we have, parents. Our kids aren't our best friends. They are our biggest responsibility. And we need to step into their lives. And bedtime gives us an opportunity to counsel them in a more intimate way. It's a chance to speak in to what's going on. When my kids were younger, you know, put them to bed, we'd read Bible stories. And that's where, that's where we had most of our spiritual conversations was at bedtime. And listen, if your kids are preschool through fifth grade here, our next-gen ministry is setting you on the tee box uh, this summer. So starting next week, we'll have a new program on Sunday morning. So today is the last day that they'll be in small groups together. So it'll be kind of a large group starting next week. And uh, it's called Amped. And they are going to be challenged to memorize 10 Bible verses over 10 weeks. So each week, they'll get a Bible verse to memorize, and you can help them. That's time that you get to spend together. And, and not only just spend it with them, but you get to memorize some scripture uh, as well. And each week the lesson is going to have a bottom line. And uh, along with that, there's going to be a family challenge where you're encouraged to do a family activity to kind of live out and lean into the bottom line that they've learned here. So we're giving you this opportunity to spend that time with your kids talking about spiritual things. That's just one way that we can resource and strengthen the family. That's one of our values. All right. Every, regardless of the family shape, we're all shaped by family. So we make strengthening and resourcing families here a priority. We're walking this journey with you. There's another resource that's called the Parent Q app. So if you don't have that, you can go to the App Store, you can go to the Google Store, and you can download Parent Q. Uh, and, and so this is curriculum that we use here. It's, it's from an organization called Orange. And you can put your kids' names in it, their, their birthdays. Um, their, uh, their, their grades, their ages, all that stuff, and then it spits out what phase they are in. So if you have a middle school child like I do, like, you know, it spits out the phase. It says to me, Carter has 323 weeks until graduation. Uh, he's 683 weeks old. I had no idea he was that old. Um, but then it gives me things to read, like this, and it changes every Sunday. So this week, it's like we can read together Matthew 28, 18 through 20, which is the Great Commission. God calling us to go make uh, disciples, gives us some things to talk about. Then it gives me some things to do. Last week, it was, um, here are the things that you can talk about at night. So at bedtime, here's some things you can talk about. This week, it's here's some things you can do. It says, 
Um, share the love. Pack your kid an extra snack like a bag of chips, a granola bar, or a sports drink to share with a friend that day. I mean, this is not rocket science, right? But what this is, this is a little bit like Karate Kid here. This is a little wax on, wax off, right? right? Because they think they're just giving a drink and sharing something. But really what they're doing is learning how to love people. That's what this is doing. And then there's a whole different deal for uh, my, my ninth grader. Uh, in there. So that's a resource that you need to take advantage of. Like every day you can do this with, uh, with your kids. And I know for, for a lot of parents, like we, we get stuck on what, what am I supposed to do? I don't know what to do with that time. This is a resource that helps you do that. You need to leverage that. Bedtime gives us counseling opportunities. And so your kids, they may be too old to tuck in now, but they are never too old for you to step in. Right? Step in. Help them interpret some things. Give them some wisdom that God has given you to give. And then he says, when you get up. When you lie down, Lord willing, you will get up the next morning and a new day brings with it a fresh start. And we may have blown it the day before um, because that's what we do as parents. We are going to blow it. But every day is a new day. Every day is a day of fresh mercies from the Lord. God offers us a do-over. And the role we play in the morning is the role of coach. Like use that as an opportunity to encourage your kids, to speak some good things into them. See, every morning we're sending our kids out the door into a world where they will be challenged. They will be questioned. They might be criticized, ridiculed, and knocked down. And we need to take advantage of the opportunity to fill them up before we send them out. I mean, here we are again. Just a couple days past another tragic school shooting. Not one parent in Santa Fe, Texas thought they were sending their kids out the door into a a crime scene. You never know. So don't leave it unsaid. If you know your kid needs to hear something, you say it. Encourage them, speak into them. A few carefully chosen words can instill value into them that will make a huge impact in their ability to stay focused on Christ, to stay focused on what matters. You need to be, we need to be as parents, the loudest voice in our kids' lives. They get so much noise that are competing for their attention. I mean, how can our voice as parents cut through all of that to help them to remember what matters most and it is not their grades and it is not making the team and it is not losing the girlfriend or the boyfriend or just a friend in general. It is loving God and loving people and your kids need to know that you are in their corner every time they walk out because they know that when they come home, you're still there. Leverage the morning to speak encouragement into their lives. And here's the good news. We don't have to make time. We just have to make use of the time that's already been made for us. God has given us a rhythm that if we take advantage of, we can maximize it. You are home almost every day. You are in the car almost every day. You go to bed every night. You wake up every morning. All you have to do is give it a little intention and a little intention can go a long way in leaving a legacy of redemption I, I, I would love it if this table could could talk and it could tell you some stories like we did we did a lot more than just eat around this table we uh, we played around this table on Friday nights you know we play uno or uh, Pictionary, or my dad would tell you know corny jokes, and I'd give anything to hear that one more time. Just one more corny joke from my dad. It could tell you the time my mom tested me on all the capitals. I remember this. I was in fifth grade, and I missed a week of school, and and so I took a test at home. I thought that was a cool thing because I thought my mom would you know help me out. <laughs> Not one bit. And uh, it could tell you about the time that we sat around this table and she told me the birds and the bees. And it could tell you how awkward that was. You know, I was 25 and <laughs> I, I, I already know all this. 
could tell you the time that my grandmother had to come and live with us because she, she broke her hip and, and that we cared for her and she was just in tremendous pain. And the thing that brought her comfort was the word of God. She had the Bible on tape, but the tapes weren't at our house. And so I would sit down at the table and I would just read scripture to her. And I, I just watched, I watched the peace come over her because of the words coming off the page of scripture. He could tell you about the night that my mom and dad and I sat around this table um, and grieved when my sister passed away. But it could tell you about some celebrations too. I turned one on this table. I uh, had my first birthday cake right there with no boundaries, just go for it. Got a picture of that with my grandmother behind me and, and my, my boys both turned one on this table and they had their first cakes on this table and they've had every birthday around this table since and in uh, and this table has seen a lot it's hurt a lot and I've got a lifetime of memories um, and a lifetime more to make sitting around that table with my family and so if you haven't heard anything that I've said today here's, here's what I just want to leave you I want to leave you with Busy won't build legacy. Busy is not an excuse. Because busy is completely up to you. Busy is completely up to me. I get it. We all have jobs to do. But you control your calendar. legacy is what you want you got to get past busy like the only busy that counts is getting busy doing legacy that and a good table and some intentional time together will redeem the long days and will shape the short years that will live long past you. That's what we're after. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, for giving us opportunity and forgiving it. Forgive us for not maximizing it, for not leveraging it, for oftentimes wasting it. And so I pray that you'd help us to see every moment and to seize every moment that we have. our family it's the foundational community it's the first institution you created it's older than the government it's older than the church the first thing you created was family and so father I pray that we would make the most of the time that you have given us so that we can give our attention to the thing that matters most Help us to set aside the distractions. Help us to set aside the excuses and to just be intentional about shaping a family who loves you and who follows you and who serves you. And God, you have given us an example because you pulled your family around a table, your disciples, you pulled them around a table to share a meal with them. And you broke bread and you gave thanks and you said, this is my body. It's broken for you. And you, you poured wine into a cup and you said, this is the blood of my new covenant poured out for the sins of many. Every time you drink of this cup and every time you eat of this bread, you do it in remembrance of me. And here we are, God, 2,000 years later, we're still gathering around a table called communion. A legacy that you built with the blood of your son. 
So Father, we're humbled today to be invited yet again to a table of grace. Speak to us in this time.